Hey everybody, it's Justin Stubleski and I'm here uh, with another uh, Facebook Live episode. Uh, joining us today is Olympus educator uh, Lee Hoy. Uh, Lee, welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, this thank afternoon you. slash evening. Um, yes, thank I'm, you for having me, Jess. Oh, no problem. I, I, this is so great, Lee. We've got this, we've got this big thing coming up um, next week, Thursday, and, we, and, and it's always kind of nice to kind of get, get to know the educator or get to know the photographer. And uh, I, I, I'm just very thankful that you're able to give us some time today uh, to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and some of the expectations and even some, some big news. I mean, you have a couple big announcements on behalf of Olympus that you're willing to share with us. Um, one, uh, one that you're willing to offer up that's a special thing that you like to do personally, um, which uh, you've told me about already. So if you guys are tuning in, uh, it's, it's worth hearing. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, but Lee, uh, you know, just to get started, uh, we're doing this, this workshop uh, this coming Thursday. Um, can you tell us a little bit of what this workshop is? Because this was like a big thing that Olympus is only doing for so many um, accounts or uh, individuals across the country. Uh, what are you going to be doing with us next week, Thursday? So next Thursday, uh, the, the uh, online webinar that we'll be offering, I'm going to be talking about the wildlife photographic experience. Because so often we get presentations that deal with technical matters, which I love the technical side of photography as much as the creative. I, I believe both are every bit equally important to the final outcome of your photographic journey. But there's a lot of things that we don't talk about much, you know, and so I've come up with a presentation where I want to talk about what happens when preparation and skill meet luck. Because frankly, when it comes to wildlife photography, all three of those elements are unbelievably important if you want to capture spectacular wildlife images. And so pre uh, preparation is going to be addressing a lot of things photographers never think about. Both Sometimes things I'll be talking about are what you do before you ever take your first shot and how you get prepped to capture an image. And then skill, I'm gonna talk about some of the aspects of photography that I often see, you know, either advanced amateurs, amateurs, beginners ignore. And, you know, so often when we begin a, a hobby, a journey, a passion, there's this beginners or, or even advanced amateurs, we tend to make the same mistakes I did. And so what are some of those mistakes that you may be making that could be hampering your overall photographic experience when it comes to your skills? So then if you take presentation and skills, what happens when you throw in a little luck? So that's what we'll be looking at next Thursday in our webinar. You know, I, I love that you have luck in there. I was, I was hanging out with a, a buddy of mine last week uh, Friday. And it just seems like he said something that had to do with luck that was like, well, wait a minute, that's not luck. That's, that's just, you're just, you're just working. And it's like, yeah, it's because you, you did all the hard work. It's not like, yeah, you can get lucky, but it's like the hard luck was because you put the work in. And that kind of sounds like what you're talking about with the, with the preparation and the skill that you're trying to attune yourself for. Um, you're setting up yourself in the best situation to allow luck to happen. Um, that's correct. Yeah. When luck, it, it, you know, sometimes a certain animal, they may not behave this way hours on end for the day, but if you're there and you've been prepared and your skill combines with that, and all of a sudden this animal does a behavior that you don't normally see, or it, mm -hmm. it does a certain thing and you capture it, that's where the luck comes in. Because you know what? I, I've been near uh, mountain lions a few times in Big Bend National Park. It's extremely difficult to ever get near one. And so there is some luck involved in getting a, a true wild mountain lion shot, not a posed one, not a stage one, not a farm animal. And I have no issues with those, but to get a true wild, uh, not a game cam, but you're behind the camera, there's some luck involved. And that luck is being in the right place at the right time. But if you don't have the presentation, the skill, but all of a sudden luck comes up in front of you, well, other people may capture it and you might not. Yeah. And it's and it's and a lot of photography, as we as we know, as photographers ourselves, is just being in the right place at the right time. And and that's because timing is everything, right? It's we're right. recording hit we're recording history and unique moments. And every moment, like the, the that second that just went by, I mean, that was that was an opportunity that right. will forever be missed. We were too busy talking live on Facebook. We missed it, man. We missed it. We didn't get it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um. So, uh, Lee, with with this coming up, I. Uh, you know, I, I know this is one thing I, we talked earlier this week uh, when we kind of did our preliminary interview. Uh, 
you know, I, I'm always amazed and interested by other people's uh, photographic journeys. You know, I went to school for all this and I admire uh, a lot of photographers work. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there um, who uh, who are creating beautiful work who aren't even formally trained. You know, one of my favorites is Chase Jarvis. I'm not I don't know if you're familiar um, but that being said, like what I'm building up to, uh, towards is I always love hearing how uh, people got started in photography. And so that leads me to uh, wanting to uh, tell everyone um, how you got started. How did Lee Hoy become a photographer? It's funny. Uh, from as far back as I can remember as a young child, wildlife fascinated me. I was the kid that asked for a copy of the National Audubon Encyclopedia of Animal Life, you know, the, the book like this when I was eight years old for my birthday. And then I was the really nerdy kid that actually read most of it. So I was the kid correcting people. No, that's an I, I No, that's a pangolin. No. And so I went to the zoos all the time. I didn't get to travel a lot as a child, but fascinated with wildlife. And living in Oklahoma, my parents were teachers. So we didn't go on a whole lot of big vacations, but my dad would regularly take us to the Wichita Wildlife Mountains uh, Refuge near Lawton, Oklahoma, where there was buffalo, longhorn, elk. Uh, that's where I saw my first two mountain lion. A lot of neat wildlife. And I remember I had this camera as a kid, and I cannot find it for anything, but it looked almost like a rifle. It had a shoulder stock. It was plastic. The pictures were heavily vignetted, and I was so short, I have pictures of dashboards a lot of times. And that was as a child, my little toy. But then when I turned 16, my mom had bought a Canon A1 years before, and it had a broken meter. And I bought a copy of John Shaw's uh, nature photography book, and he talked about the Sunny F-16 rule. So with a mm -hmm. uh, basically a 75 to 300, I believe, lens, a Canon A1 with a broken meter, and the Sunny F-16 rule, I would head out with some rolls of Kodachrome and did all the calculations in my head, you know, particularly work practice with buffalo and prairie dogs and whatnot, things that didn't move too terribly fast. And so I was forced to learn manual exposure from the very beginning, which long, and I didn't know there were other photographers who could help me. I just did it all on my own. And honestly, that became one of my best experiences with it. I was forced to do everything in my head. And so I learned a lot about exposure. I learned a lot about reading light. But don't get me wrong. I was still a pretty crappy photographer as a beginner, like many people. But I was forced <laughs> into thinking differently. So uh, I, I got more and more serious about photography. I then a Canon 630 with the 100 to 300, that 4.5 and 5.6, the first L lens. I used it for 21 years, I believe. And so are we talking about the we're talking about the EOS film system, right? 35 yes. millimeter film. Yes. EOS. Yes, that is correct. Okay. The EOS okay. Film system. And so I would remember I, my first trip to Big Bend National Park. I, I took like 38 rolls of film and shot it and what happened was i took a picture of a bird in the basin and i thought i don't know what that is it turned out to be a uh, canyon towie and i got very interested in birding and what happened was my birding passion overtook photography for a while i still photographed till my 630 died digital was just coming out it was very expensive and i said no nah, not yet and then one day after having been to nome and the pribiloffs and whatnot i went oh my gosh i've been to the pribiloff islands without a single picture this is silly. And I then I got back into the digital uh, cameras that were coming out and my passion for photography just skyrocketed. And that's really what uh, kept me on the journey that brought me to where I am today. Very nice. Um, so that kind of leads me into my next question. You know, you were talking about, uh, you know, you're talking about you started shooting with the, the EOS 630, you said? That was the second camera after the A1. Yeah, your second camera. So what? Um, what? That kind of leads me into like, well, what did you start it? What did you start shooting with from from there? Because it sounds it sounds like you made this transition to digital. What did you go to with digital right away? Uh, or or how did you transition from film to digital? Because I've, obviously that's the natural way to go. Because you're not a film shooter yet today, are you? No, I'm not. No, digital's come so far. Uh, I, for me, the nostalgia film isn't there like it is for some people. The pain in the rear of developing it, changing out roles. I, I, I don't find any enjoyment in film. If, you, if some do, that's awesome, but I don't. So uh, 
what happened was there was like a T, I think it was a T2I or T3I, and I still had that 100 300 lens that had been sitting around for 10 years and it worked. Yeah, it was slow autofocus, but it's it was great image quality. And then macro, I got a little interested in macro. And because of my interest in wildlife, my, my, my interest has grown in insects and on and on. And because of I've been so involved in wildlife in Texas, I, I met John and Kendra Abbott, who are redoing the Peterson Field Guide to Insects. And next thing you know, I'm really into insects. And so I've known some pretty high level biologists and wildlife folks throughout my life that have expanded my interest. And so then I go from a T2I to a 7D and I go to Newfoundland in winter and shooting at minus 38 degrees. And so I began in my passion. Then I wanted full frame because I love landscape photography, tilt shift lenses. And, you know, I probably had 10 or 11 lenses. Then I added a, a Sony a7 III. Uh, uh, to my repertoire for night sky photography, living in uh, the night skies at my house. If there's no moon and I turn the lights off in my house, I'm coming to you from 6,431 feet up in the Davis Mountains of West Texas. Don't need air conditioning. It's not on. My doors are open. It's spectacular outside. <laughs> and so now I can walk out my front door and do some of the best night sky photography in the country. Oh, so, you bum. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love the fact I can do it. So, for me, you know, Sigma art lenses and man, my, my bags got bigger and heavier, but I also do. And I had a Canon 600. My wife, uh, uh, you know, I was able to get one quite a few years ago. But then when I got to Big Ben, I do the Kalima Warbler hike to see the Kalima Warbler, which is a 10 mile round trip, 1700 foot elevation gain in the first two and a half miles. And most of you have probably ne never carried a 600 on a tripod up there, but I do. I'm Scottish. I'm built like a mule. <laughs> it's old. It gets real old. And um, while I was excellent at using a tripod and getting, the, I, I photographed peregrines in flight with that setup. The fact is big lenses, big cameras, big tripods, they are limiting. They're extremely limiting. Uh, and I'm a tripod, I'm a believer in tripods until I came to the Olympus system. And now I rarely have to pull out my tripod. So uh, with that being said, um, because I kind of want to come back to that, because I think that's a question all on its own, but I'm kind of interested how you got started in the in the photo industry outside of, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you, um, you know, you were you doing a lot of stuff professionally with the with the 630, the your film system? Like, oh, how did you yeah. get into the, did you get into it commercially? How did you start, how did you become more of that pro professional photographer, you know, going from that starting point to kind of, you know, some people have that inter uh, that intermediate point where, you know, I did some studio assisting in Minneapolis for a food studio um, before, you know, kind of moving here and getting into the photo industry um, on the store level and helping others get into photography. But how did you get into the photo industry outside of just getting started? So at age 16, I knew I wanted to be a wildlife biologist and a photographer. But sometimes other people have more plans for your life than you have for your own. And so I listen to everybody else. I've been a professional transportation planner, computer demand modeling. Don't fall asleep on me. I did that for 10 years. I went to seminary. I planted <laughs> a church. I went through an unexpected divorce. I went into insurance. <sighs> I did roofing. I never had time for photography. I always wanted to do photography, but I was one who was too scared to trust not knowing exactly how much income I had coming in every month. I just couldn't have that faith, that trust mm -hmm. that it'll be okay. So I hindered myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and life circumstances just didn't allow it. I mean, I, it, my first marriage, it wouldn't have been conducive to being a professional photographer. I then went to work for the state of Texas as the supervisor of the Judge Roy Bean Visitor Center. And at uh, in my late 40s, I sat down one day after having had some uh, harassment at work from people above me, and I said, life is short. Life is very short. And it is too short to worry about how much money you make. It is way more important to know that I want to wake up in the morning and I will work from the time I get up to the time I go to bed if it doesn't feel like I've worked a minute in my life. And I told my wife, I said, I might completely fail, that we might lose everything, but I've lost everything once before in a divorce. I said, today I'm changing my life and I'm going to go do what I love because I'm very passionate. I know photography inside now. I, I love it. I love sharing the world with people. And I said, this is going to work. And I won't, to say I wasn't scared at times would be an utter lie. I mean, there were days I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I am going to lose everything. And then I just said, you know what? No, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to work out. And ultimately I realized if you search on Yellowstone National Park, if you search on Glacier, 
if you search on local photography guide or wildlife guide, you will get hundreds of hits. But Big Bend, I mean, I've been in 49 states, seven Canadian provinces, multiple countries, and Big Bend is where my soul feels at most at home. There's nothing like Big Bend National Park anywhere else. You can, if you say you're going to pay for a summer trip to Yellowstone or Big Bend, I choose Big Bend every single time. We have more snakes than they have mammals. I mean, frankly, Yellowstone from a diversity standpoint is boring in summer compared to Big Bend. So I, I, I looked at, there wasn't a single local photography or birding guide for Big Bend, not a single one. And I was like, there's an untapped niche here. And I've been on every trail, every road. I did a vegetation map with a professor of the park. I, I can, I, you tell me, I want to go shoot sunset. I know, well, these are the 20 spots based on how the clouds are right now we should go to. And so I started Big Bend Birding and Photo Tours. And I would have been very content if that was my only world. But, and I made you a little emotion. I met a man named Kevin Laughlin, who, with Wild Side Nature Tours, met him uh, doing a booth at a festival. And we just got to joking, and I'm a character. I, that's a nice way of saying a, a smart man. Like, but <laughs> he hit it off and goes, hey, why don't you come do some stuff for me? So I've been to Amazon, Yellowstone in winter, which, by the way, Yellowstone in winter rocks the world compared to summer. Um, the I've been to Costa Rica, Galapagos Islands, you know, doing Panama. -ish. And so my world expanded and it literally is just like a snowball going down the way my career has blown up. But I believe it's because when people go on a workshop with me or they're with, they see me with my equipment, they know that, that I'm passionate and that I love it. And that I get as much joy from looking at the back of your camera and seeing a spectacular shot as I get when I look at the back of my camera and see that shot because my parents were teachers. My grandfather was a professor. So education is in my blood, but I knew I never wanted to be a teacher. I didn't want to be a professor. I knew, but this lets, this is an outlet for me to teach others because when I see my first primate, I teared up, I was moved. And I want you to have that same experience because the reality is, is the photographic experience. It's about the memory. You know, when you look at an image, that image triggers everything in your mind. It triggers the weather, the moment, the 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 the, the view or the, the animal, the people you were with, the smells. So when I look back to my images, it, it takes me back there. And so that for me is what brings out joy. I, I only submit to a couple of magazines. They were ones I looked at as a child. Parks, Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, Texas Highways. Uh, you know, I, I don't care about being published a lot. It's cool, but you know, you're not making a living doing it. So my passion, mm -hmm. that person is standing next to me and I, I'm really good at spotting stuff and you get them on something they've never seen. Um, that, that, that's what lets me go to sleep at night. That's, that's really cool. I, I, I love hearing about that passion and I can tell you that um, I can really uh, relate to, you know, that enjoyment when you're helping somebody else create something. And that's, and that's kind of what, um, you know, I, I, I need to go out and create stuff for myself. And I like I think that's what we all need to do. We all need to kind of uh, get always kind of remember ourselves and go create work. But I one of the things that if I'm not creating work, because I went through a dry spell from October through at least, you know, kind of through May here. And that was it wasn't because of COVID-19. It was just like after I went on my photo trip in the fall, I just didn't have any desire to shoot. Um, but I love being able to sell people cameras and I love being able to help you know, kind of like I see the passion that is in you that I see in other people. And it's like I, I, I know what I can get in your hands to help you start creating that magic that I have found. And when I can see the results on the back of your camera, kind of like what you're talking about, or when you get to see people that uh, customers grow, you know, as like you see them from year to year to year. And when they have that aha moment and they start creating beautiful work. You know, that's that's a good feeling. So I, I is that the same feeling you're kind of talking about when you're on these trips and you look at the back of the camera and you're like, that's it. That's it. Exactly. You've like you've got it figured out. Now just keep on plugging, plugging away because it's all downhill from here. It's all easy. breezy. <laughs> uh, here's a great example. I pull up to Daniel's Ranch right on the Rio Grande River, the Mexico border in Big Bend National Park. And I, I jumped in one of those, you know, pit toilets there. Couldn't have been in there for a minute. And as I come out. I had a, a great couple with me. They're going with me to the Galapagos. They've converted to Columbus completely from full frame. I come out and she goes, look at this. And she holds up the back of her camera. And it is a bobcat shot that I, 
better than any I've got. And mm -hmm. the Bobcat is an early morning light, but the background has shadows, so it's dark. It's tack sharp, and I'm like, my God, where is it? I've only been in the bathroom for a minute. She goes, oh, yeah, it's right there. I go, you don't show me pictures when there's a Bobcat out. And I got some shots. Mine look, none of them are nearly as beautiful. And, but I told her, I said, that's the best shot any of my clients has got in Big Ben of a mammal. I mean, it's just it's just beautiful. And I was so, yeah, I hated missing the shot. But the reality is they had paid me to take them there to get that shot. So I was like, oh, my gosh. that's." Then we keep driving. And later, a couple of them are laying by the side of the road. We get out. I'm laying on the ground. We're shooting them. None of my shots were still as good because of the lighting. And I was just like, she did it. And, yeah, that that got me so stoked. I still think about that moment like – so the tip is just wet your britches, get the shot. That's all I can yeah. say. <laughs> um, yeah, that's 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 it's just it's just a reinvigorating thing. Sometimes that can refuel you enough. It's like, man, I should really go out and kind of, you know, go do that myself. So, yes. um, yeah. yeah, and and that's the rewarding thing. Is just if I can't go shoot myself, I'll live vicariously through the people that I'm that I'm helping to go do that. And so maybe like maybe that's enough, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So with that being said, it sounds at that point, I heard a couple of times that you, I mean, you obviously are an Olympus educator now. Um, you, you kind of hinted at some points, you know, uh, some people who have gone from full frame converting to Olympus. How did you yourself working in the industry, being a wildlife guide, it sounds like, how did you become an Olympus educator? How did, how did, how did, you know, did you seek out Olympus? Did Olympus seek you out? How did, how did that happen? Well, uh, Kevin at Wildside had been given some Olympus gear to try out. Uh, Kevin had suffered some heart issues, and he was looking at light, trying to lighten the load, which is an Olympus class I teach, because of just the, the strain of carrying um, full-frame gear. He'd been a long, lifelong cannon shooter as well, I believe. So we met, and he started telling me about it. And I'll be honest, I had tried every – I tried mirrorless cameras, Fuji system – if for huh. landscape, and, it was fine, but and for, you did mention one of my favorites. I mean, it sounds you had an A7 III or still do, and I mean, you I know you use it for night, it. <laughs> uh, you use it for night skies. I mean, that's what I use it for. I have an A7 R2 for my landscape, so it's you're no stranger to other mirrorless cameras. No, and I, I so so every time I went because I go to birding festivals and teach workshops, and and uh, I'm often at the booth for Wild Side or Big Ben Birding and Photo Tours, depending on where it's at. But I, I was just I, I, I was just tired and I, I, I'm physically fit. I can carry uh, a, a long lens as far as anybody, but you just get tired of it. It's just why am I doing this? And when I saw his gear, I went to the uh, I believe it was the Space Coast. No, Florida Birding and Photo Fest uh, in uh, St. Augustine and Steve Ball. That, that was the one that was. That was canceled this year, right? That was canceled this year. Yes, it yeah. was. Unfortunately, I normally that. happens. It yeah. normally happens, what, every every March or something like that? Uh, that one is in April. That one is April, in April. okay. And um, Steve Ball was there at the time. He was an uh, Olympus rep, and now he's an Olympus educator. And he's just one of the nicest guys that I've met in the industry, to be honest. And he allowed me to take out his personal M1X 300F4 with 1.4. So I had my Canon, and I had his stuff. And I'm walking down the boardwalk at the alligator farm there, and there was a tricolored heron like four feet away. Mm -hmm. And the way it was perched, I wouldn't have even been able to get the shot with the Canon 600 because I didn't, you know, I didn't have 16 feet of uh, between me and the bird. I'd like four. And I said, well, man, that'd be fun to try it on. Kevin goes, take the shot. And he said, keep it on low ISO. And I thought, what do you mean? He said, oh, I said, what's close focus? He goes, like four feet. I said, you're kidding me. So 840 millimeters of camera. Because you had the 1.4 teleconverter on. On the 300, right? I did. Yep. So 840. I put it at 1 15th of a second. Because everybody had been bragging about the image stabilization. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sure, okay. Put yeah, it whatever. at 1 15th. <laughs> and I'm hand-holding. Set my tripod down with my other stuff. You know, I fire off 20 or 30 shots knowing that 1 15th. And I start looking. And the number of tack-sharp images are blowing me away. And the detail in my eye. And immediately I went... Okay, because I, I tried the Sony 8.9. The autofocus is great. It wouldn't have focused on that bird from that yeah. close. Um, I went, oh, my gosh, this just revolutionized my photography. So I shot the rest of that day with it at the festival. 
Uh, was there was there like a BS moment? Like, no, this is voodoo magic. This is too good to be true. You got to be kidding me. Or was it really just like, okay, there's something here. I've heard people talk about it. There's something here. The BS moment was after I bought it, but I had not learned all the features. And I'll talk okay. about how I plan to be frustrated a little bit. Okay. So at first I was like, oh my gosh, I can, I'm like, it's so light. Now what's funny is long-term Olympus, long-time Olympus users complain about the size and weight of the M1X. And I laugh. I just go, oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. This is like <laughs> a child's toy compared to the other stuff I've been shooting with. So I had to give the camera gear back. He wouldn't let me take his own personal. I come home to Texas. I pack up my 600 and my 70 to 200, 2.8, you know, version two or three, whatever it was. And, I, and one other lens. And I go to Austin. I go to Precision Camera. I said, how much will you give me? And I have a picture of me and iPhone shot holding the 300 F4, which is, you know, the equivalent of the 600, the Canon 600. And I have a picture of me holding the size difference. And I literally did not shed a tear at that point. Okay? <laughs> I get the gear. I, I mean, and for the price, for everything I got, I think I picked up two bodies, you know, four lenses. And I was like, plus the money savings, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I come home and the time of year I get this, I start getting about seven or eight species of hummingbirds in my yard. I do, oh, a, nice. I do capture the hummingbird workshops. I literally, you're 15 feet from where I'm sitting shooting hummingbirds. And I bring you your drinks and the blinds while you're doing high speed hummingbird stuff. And I, I'm sitting out there and I, I haven't even read the owner's manual and I'm an owner manual guy, but I just want to start. And I started getting a little frustrated. So it was a little dark. I couldn't focus. Well, I didn't know about live view boost. Once I heard that, I'm like, Oh, well that solves that problem. And then I start doing the high speed shots and I can still see the hummingbird in the electron viewfinder, even when the high speed flashes, you know, it's like, and I'm like, Oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> uh, and so the learning curve is there and the learning curve is there because this camera has features and functions that the other camera companies haven't even sniffed at. Mm -hmm. I laughed when Canon talked about its new mirrorless the other day we have, and I'm like, Ooh, had it for two years. Welcome to the club, you know, and it's not even one of the best features on the mirrorless here. So I, I love this. I, I'm bought in and I'm one of those. I'm honest. Like if my wife says, how do I look in this dress? My wife gets the real answer. I'm not afraid of being truthful. <laughs> You're not afraid of, afraid of sleeping on the couch that night? <laughs> no, I'm not. I could say, mm, don't ask if you don't want to know. <laughs> how do you like this shot? Mm, <laughs> it stinks. Keep trying, you know? Mm -hmm. So because I want people to know when I say, wow, they know that's a true wow. Yeah. That, that's how I'm wired. So I'm shooting and shooting and I'm, I'm beginning to love, like I don't need to try pod for high speed hummingbird stuff. I can hand hold it enough to set it down. Look, I'm, my arms aren't exhausted. My arms aren't tired. And the more I'm using it, the more I'm going, oh my gosh. And then I try live composite. Live composite has made shooting lightning. I know I'm going to capture the images. I mm -hmm. laugh at another guy who just walked up next to me in Big Ben the other day and he's trying, you know, the, the long exposure. Oh, I mean, and I'm just sitting there with live composite started. I'm going, Oh, look, I'm up to 15 bolts. How many do you have? He didn't have any. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm yeah, come with I go, you don't want to come look at the back of my camera. So the more I learned the features, I, I was just loving it. And, and I'm, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about what I do. Oh yeah. And Steve was at another festival. And I said, listen, um, I don't, I, he, they know how many people I've been sending them convert, convert converts, you know, to Olympus. And I said, look, I would love to, have, however I can, whatever it would be. And I started, I learned about the Olympus educator program. I said, look, there's ever a way. And next thing you know, uh, I was contacted and invited to join the, uh, the group, which was a tremendous honor for me. I am very proud to represent Olympus. I feel confident. I'm very hard on my equipment. I drop it. I don't, I, I kneel with it in snow. I pour water over it to clean it. Go do that with your Sony or your Canon. Uh, on the Galapagos, <laughs> I have sand all over it. I just pour my water bottle or hold it under a sink. I double dog dare you to do that with cameras you've spent three or double the money on. Go give it a shot. See how that works for you. And I just know that this is a product to get behind. And then I found out that I was one of the top two people in terms of getting people converted in the country. And that was one of the reasons they realized, no, Lee's, Lee's a, you know, I'm an, an Olympus evangelist, if you will, in the sense that if I, <laughs> if I don't believe in your product, you don't want to ask me a question. I've had that happen. I'm like, look, yeah. I'm going to tell you, this is terrible. But the reality is 
as hard as I am on my equipment, as much as I use it in the conditions I use it, uh, it hasn't filled me down. Minus 14 in Yellowstone, 140 in my car in Big Bend, you know, when it gets really warm, leaving it in the car. No worries, no problems whatsoever. So uh, I'm, I'm a genuine believer, and it has revolutionized my photography, there's no doubt. I guess, I mean, with, with you saying that real quick before we kind of move on to some other things, um, because you were saying it's it's revolutionized your photography. I guess you, you talked about some of the weather sailing, but against some of the other things that you've used, what is you know what has been some of the favorite features that have really just stood out to you? And I know you've kind of mentioned some of them, but I don't know if there's any that you could just really yeah. drive home. So imagine going to the Amazon to do a, we were doing, uh, I was co-leading an Amazon riverboat workshop and imagine having 12 people in a little skiff going up a tributary and imagine you were so fortunate that, that, um, a male, female, and a young night owl monkey, you know, uh, are both, all three have their heads out of the burrow, out of the, the, uh, hole in the tree. Imagine standing in a skiff that is rocking, and knowing that you've never seen anything like this before and that this is a special moment, but it was overcast, kind of low light. I squeezed myself in the skiff between a ladder and the edge of the boat, which was probably, you know, a foot and a half to two foot of space. And I kneeled down and I was lucky to be able to do like one thirtieth, one sixtieth of a second at 840 millimeters. And imagine getting hundreds and hundreds of tack sharp images and listening to all the participants that have full frame systems and they're standing trying to handhold and all you can hear is them bemoaning the lack of any sharp images. So the image stabilization is, uh, when I say game changer, that's probably the number one. Then number two is the pro capture mode. Um, you know, when we were on the Galapagos Islands, when you wait for the marine iguanas to blow salt out their nose, you can burn thousands of images in a, in a regular camera system and not capture it. But with pro capture mode, I was able to capture four shots of the salt being ejected in maybe a five minute period. Wow. I, I will put that up against any other camera system. You, you won't be able to do it. Uh, so I'm not having to rely on my tripod. I imagine having a live neutral density filter. And at Box Canyon Falls in Colorado, where I, in Colorado, I do a fall uh, foliage workshop. Box Canyon Falls, you can't take a tripod back there on the walkway. Handheld, two and a half second, live built-in neutral density filter. So I get a blurry waterfall. I have tack sharp rocks and I handheld it at two and a half seconds. Can you pull that off with any other system? The answer is no, because they don't have built-in neutral density filter. I'm not having to screw on a filter. I'm not having to do something like that. And I like really like the wine country camera system, but I don't have to use it as much. I still use it at times. Imagine, the again, the live composite mode. Uh, a built-in intervalometer and interval shooting. The reality is because of the features in here, uh, I capture uh, humming uh, uh, warblers and, and birds up high. I can hike five miles and even tired. I want to get a tack sharp shot because of the features and the lightweight. So now in the Glock Islands, I have a dual black rapid sports system with a quick uh, disconnect Kirk, you know, connectors. So I can pull it off quick. I have a 1DX with a 300F4 with either a 1.4 or 2.0 on it. I have a 1DX with a 40 to 150 with a doubler on it. And then in a pocket, I have a Mark II or Mark III with a 12 to 40 that I can pull out real quick and shoot wide angle like a, a, a sea lion in her pup on the, on the coast, put it back and go right back to shooting long lens. I dare you. Because I have carried, I've carried a big Canon 600, the 100 or 400, a macro at once. I dare you to make the, compare the difference of what that's like. You and, can't stick any of those in your pocket. And, and you brought up an interesting point that I never thought about because I wanted to ask, you know, what, you know, you're talking about some of these great features, but there's, there, I, I didn't even begin to think of the minimum focusing distance that you have, the, the minimum focusing distance issue that you would have with a lot of these. Uh, pro lenses and, and other, you know, other comparable systems as far as, you know, full frame. 
you know, I know that the 300 has a, um, there's a super, a super macro mode or something like that. And what is it like? It can focus within three feet or something like that. Yeah, about four, right around four. So I took a shot just for grins in the Galapagos Islands. There was a fly on foliage at my foot. And I looked straight down with the 300 F4, the 1.4, took a shot, cropped slightly. You would think I took the shot with a true macro lens. It's spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, you're not doing that with number one. You're not hand holding a big lens, pointing it straight down at your feet, and getting a sharp shot. Well, when when the lens touch your toes, I mean, <laughs> uh, just, about, lens you're using. just about, yeah, yeah. I do see people hand holding 500s and stuff at times, but you know they're not hand holding it long, yeah. and they're still not doing it with the. And I could lay on the beach, yellow warblers coming up within two and a half, three feet, and I have to put the 300 aside. I grab the 40 to 150. And I'm getting shots that nobody else is getting because they can't focus on it. Yeah. 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 It's so light. I, I, I was one of those who used to just a shoe pulling out a screen and holding the camera down low, thinking they're never getting a tack sharp shot. Now I put the 30 millimeter macro, which is this gargantuan beast. You know, that's uh, here's a pin. Okay. So there's a pin. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you need something crack. for reference. You need something for reference yes. to show that against. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the 30 millimeter macro. Now I can put it on one DX, flip my screen out, hold it an inch off the sand and wait for the waves to wash over hermit crabs and just, tch, 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 tch. and every one of them's tack sharp. It's just a matter of picking which wave shot you like the best. Yeah. It's like right where, like where, where are those grains of sand? Where, where's that, where's that ro yes. water falling? Yeah. Yes. So, yep. so I, I got to ask, um, with like we we are up against the minimum focusing distances and it sounds like you know hey we've got four feet versus 16 feet for one of those 600s um but what kind of weight did you shed moving from your like because you said that you took all your stuff to precision camera you're like hey i, I got all my lenses packed up i put everything in the bag and i kind of took it with me on average um what was your what was your kind of uh your take on these uh you know, your full frame, when, when you would do like a wildlife uh, kind of adventure, when you were shooting full frame, what kind of a load down did you have versus what you were packing with your Olympus? Like what's the weight differential that uh, do you think? You know, I calculated exactly one day to talk, to help a client realize the differences they were talking about. And I think on the 600 combo, I shed close to seven or eight pounds uh, on other combos. It's excuse me, between two and five. Um, uh, and the reality is, is, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of my clients are older folks. And as you age, obviously your strength goes, your ability to handhold, but this is going to revolutionize for them, not because of the lighter weight combined with the image stabilization, you just simply are going to get shots that before you just couldn't get. When I say it revolutionize it, what I mean is I, I will, you know, before you'd look at a scene and go, uh, I'm not even going to bother. I don't want to shoot that at 12,800 ISO. Now I go, yeah, like pygmy marmoset, you know, in the, in the forest, 300 F4, and I'm putting it on 1 30th of a second. And if he didn't move, tack sharp images. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, they're getting their tripod, they're trying to set up or they're trying to handhold, and they're up at, up at ridiculously high ISOs. And I, I don't mind shooting my Olympuses at ISO 6400, by the way. You just have you have to just process. I process my images differently than I did with my Canon and, and uh, sure. Sony lenses. I, I have no issues going up high. I've got I've got ISO 4000, you know, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 4500 and, and higher uh, from the trip. No, no worries shooting higher, but I can shoot lower because it's going to work. It's This is a camera where when you have image stabilization on and you're moving a lot, you can actually watch it work. You know, it's like if you turn that, if you turn off the IS button on the lens, you realize, oh my God, man, am I, if I've been drinking and then you turn it on, <laughs> it's like the slow mo version on your iPhone. You're just like, holy cow. So when I say revolutionize this, I'm taking shots. I wouldn't take a handheld two and a half second shot, even for grins before. Now you're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's really nice. So, you know, and again, in addition to some of the features, that's what I mean is I am getting the shots that before you might just go, oh, God, I just don't want to put in the time for that. You know, uh, like in macro, the 60 millimeter, which is honestly, I think the best value for virtually any lens sold by any company. This is the best lens I've used price per pound uh, by far. And when I bought it, 
I bought it just because it wasn't a pro, and I thought, oh, I'll get this, you know. Yeah, it's waterproof like the pro. And so I put it on my camera, took some shots, and I looked at the back, and I was like, holy crap. I immediately mm-hmm. went through it on my 27-inch iMac, and I was like, this is this is ridiculous. And I posted pictures to a macro group on Facebook, and like four Europeans bought that lens that day because they said, how many images stacked is that? And I said, that is one. That's one. <laughs> and they were like, holy no. cow, I bought this lens. I'm like, this is the best quality lens for the price of any I've ever bought, hands down. The 40 to 150 is pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of great stuff there. Um, you know, so we, you know, talking about a lot of this great stuff, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, just the kind of the special attributes, um, you know, shedding weight, minimum focusing distances, just making shooting easier uh, for people. Um, let's kind of transition into how, um, you, you know, you, you had these special announcements. You know, we're, we're talking about all the great stuff that Olympus has done for you and your clientele, um, but they, they keep on doing new greater and greater stuff and we know that there's that they're transitioning in september you know moving their ownership um but that hasn't stopped the good stuff from flowing because you've got an announcement for us today that's right and and by the way i i think i have five or six olympus bodies right now getting ready to get another one i have paid for all of them but one i have paid for all of my lenses so unless you think well he's an educator he gets paid to no, I don't. I'm, I'm more than happy to buy the gear because I know what it does for me. So, you know, I've seen a lot of crazy headlines out there trying to get you to click on them. Here's what I know. You know, in a in a meeting the other day, when I look at the lens map, if you look at the new uh, lens roadmap that was posted on GetOlympus.com mm-hmm. last night, you will see there's a longer uh, macro in the pro section coming. Oh, my gosh. You give me a 100 millimeter which is a 200 millimeter equivalent pro macro lens and i'm going to sort myself right now i can't wait well, the, well what if it has close focusing and it's weather sealed you know what i'm saying like it can focus within it, you know a there foot. will be no other macro lens out there to touch it then yeah. you guys saw the 150 to 400 or if you didn't a picture of this a 150 to 400 with a 4.5 constant aperture with a built-in 1.25 uh, teleconverter, there will be no other wildlife lens on the market touching that. And the reality is you'll be able to show shoot at such long focal lengths. And I fully expect we'll be able to handhold that in the 1100, maybe 180, oh, yeah. if you're really For still. Sure. Again, there will be no better bird or wildlife lens on the market. For the size, the price, the portability, and the features uh, you know, uh, we had a meeting the other day and I got to see there's programmable buttons. Uh, there there are some features that I haven't seen on another long lens like this. So to say this is probably the most anticipated lens that I've ever been aware of for me personally, hands down. And about the same time that lens will be released this winter, if I, I could care less about auto racing, motorcycle racing, but if you've ever <laughs> seen the, 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 the autofocus tracking in the Olympus, I've seen mm-hmm. it work on video on TVs with yes. auto racing yep. on it, locking on the helmets. They are releasing the bird autofocus firmware this winter. If it works a quarter as well as it does. Their plane trains automobile thing. I will be ecstatic. Absolutely. So here's one of the problems is Olympus is going to make it so easy to get phenomenal shots. Are you still going to need me? <laughs> That's how incredible <laughs> technology is. And they'll always need me because most of you don't read your manuals, you know, so, <laughs> job security. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Job security. The reality yeah. is this is going to be yet another game changer when it comes to imagery. So, and then you see, they've come out with the webcam software. They just, they're at the forefront of innovation. And so when people say, well, what if they sell? Well, if you're a company that buys that kind of innovation, I'll be honest, whether the name Olympus is on it or maybe they'll name it after me, maybe it's the Hoy OMD system. You know? <laughs> Whatever the name is, I don't care. I want the innovation that's in there. The name, yeah, it'd be cool if it said Olympus. But listen, if they keep producing these kind of features, uh, and if this were a, a fire sale, 
you wouldn't release the lens roadmap that we got last night. You so, burn everything. You burn all the inventory yeah, and everything. It's, it's a crash and burn. Not, hey, by the way, we are still putting money into amazing research development. We got asked a question not too long ago. Tell us any feature you could imagine you want on a camera. I was like, well, it'd be cool to identify, you know, blend iNats ID, iNaturalist ID with your camera so you know what subjects you shot as soon as you shoot it. So we threw stuff like that. You know I mean? That's the kind of innovation we're talking about. Not just creating Model 3 with a couple of other features that really doesn't do anything for you. That's the kind of innovation they're looking at. And that's kind of part of the company I want to be. Yeah, I, I, uh, our Olympus rep, I don't know if you've met him, Mike Amico. Yeah, no, um, right. sure I, uh, I've told him a lot of, you know, many, many times, uh, you know, it's, uh, if there's any system and I'm passionate about, you know, I, I love my Sony's. I love them for doing landscape. I, I tell everyone, um, you know, for me, cameras are tools and each camera provides a different feature. I would love to have, I would love to see a Fuji Olympus hybrid because I want the Fuji sensor in the Olympus camera with all the Olympus features, because I, I love the way that they have, uh, their sensors kind of randomized. Um, I, you know, I love my Sony's. I would love to see, uh, Sony kind of integrate a lot of these great computational photography attributes that Olympus has integrated into their system, into the Sony system. Um, but that being said, you know, my Sony's, they're great landscape cameras, you know, my A7R2 for landscapes, my A7 III for the night sky landscapes, you know, but my Olympus just makes a lot of that stuff fun. And I just love the computational attributes. And, um, and that's the thing. I, I, I know I've thrown things at him like, well, you know, if you guys did this, if you did this, and um, it's great that they're taking, it sounds like they're taking a lot of feedback from you guys in the field uh, to help incorporate and try to, you know, make the system better. You know, Canon still can't make a hood for the Canon 600 where the knob doesn't break off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I mean, if I spend $14,000 on a lens, my knob breaks off twice. We, we can't get a knob that stays on, much less forget tremendous innovation. So for me, I find that the fact that they're, consulting those of us in the field for input tells you all you need to know about a company. What do the users, what do our educators have to say? What would you like to see? Really? You want our opinion, not just passing down what you're going to do. That is why I believe they have the kind of features they do in there. And frankly, for, for some camera accessory manufacturers, this kind of technology is going to be a, a bad thing because you're not going to need to buy tons of, how about this? If I spend, uh, if I spend an obscene amount of money on a lens, why doesn't my foot have a built-in Arca Swiss plate like like my Olympus cameras do? Mm -hmm. Why and not? Why not spend another hundred and fifty bucks for an Arca on a Swiss plate. Apple plate? Yeah, and and you're seeing a lot of that now. I'm I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, tripod you know plate uh, tripod collars you know have integrated uh, dovetail plates, and it's kind of nice that we finally have gotten to a point in the tripod lineups. That you know the tripod companies have kind of decided like oh yeah we can I guess we can all have some kind of dovetail system in our Arca Swiss system in our in our tripod so that has kind of helped a lot of things it's like you know is kind of forcing the hand of some of the other companies to yes. to do that yeah. but what you're talking about you know you're talking about your live comp um, you know live comp has has eliminated the use for you know like a Pluto trigger you know and and I've heard a lot of people some of our customers here have gone down to the beach and they show up they they run a live comp they get the lightning bolt someone looks over at their camera camera kind of like you were describing they said how did you do that it's like it's just a feature and they're like no that's cheating well if it is and that's the that's kind of like a, a question to ask you Lee since you've been doing this for a while um, is it cheating if the camera system offers it? You know, is, is computational photography, which is what Olympus has adopted, and that's something I think that as Olympus gets closer to what these can do, right, what our cell phones can do comp computationally by doing these, you know, the, 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 the depth of field, you know how they have the portrait mode where it fakes the depth of field. Um, I think that the closer Olympus gets to what a cell phone can do, you're bridging this gulf between here's a camera that if I took a Canon 5D Mark III and I married it to my cell phone, this is the love child that I would get. I would get what Olympus has encompassed inside of it. And I think the closer they get to something like that and the, and the further they can integrate what, what we can do to bridge it to this, you know, there's nothing you can't do with it at yeah. that point. All I will say is, I would expect that love child to have a name. 
<laughs> Olympus, right? We're hoping yeah. it still says Olympus. That, that I, love child, yeah, yeah. There, there, there will be a love child with that name. Yeah. So, um, so you're doing this. Uh, we we got that special announcement. That, you know, they're going to be able to do oh, this right. webcam. Um, was was there anything more with that? Yes. So I'm going to make an offer to those of you today and at the webinar on Thursday. Of course, today you're getting a little bit of a heads up, so you might beat the people on Thursday. Or maybe I'll just be a nice guy and do it for each. But if you go into the camera shop uh, and you tell them you watched Facebook Live and you saw me, the big bald bearded guy from West Texas, and you spend $5,000 on Olympus gear, then I will give you two free hours of online instruction. And I'll split that into one hour session so that you can look at the menu intensely on one and the next one we can look at other features. So the first person to spend five thousand dollars on Olympus gear at the camera shop will get two free hours of online instruction from me. And we'll arrange that at a time that works for both of us. And it will only be you. It won't be a group. The, the first person to spend three thousand on Olympus gear will get one hour on free online instruction. So when you go down, if you go to you know trade in your other equipment or just buy some new Olympus gear, let them know, hey, I watched the Facebook Live with Lee and Justin, and am I the first one? And how do I get it? And, and Justin's got all my information, and I 100% promise you, you will get that because I want to make sure that your investment uh, gets paid off with another investment because I'm invested in you doing well with your gear. There is a learning curve. It offers a lot. I've read the owner's manual for my 1DX at least three or four times. I've read my Mark III now, probably two or three. You you have to learn. you you got to give yourself some time to transition. And uh, I find, to me, the menus are very self-explanatory. They I love the way they flow. There's two items in there that, yeah, I'd like for them to have a little different name. But, you know, if that's the worst I can say about it, I'm doing pretty good. So I want to make that special offer to you, and I'll make it again on Thursday. So whoever gets in there first will get the free um, the free uh, instruction. And that's and that's a great offer, Lee. And I can't thank you enough for you know for offering to do that. And and just to be clear, that's the first like it's a five thousand all encompassing purchase and a three thousand yes. all encompassing purchase. Yes. Yeah. And is yeah. and is it is it just limited to the Olympus gear? Like it has to be five thousand in Olympus gear, or is it kind of like my purchase total? with everything that I'm going to buy today. Yeah. Like, so if you bought an Olympus body, a couple of Olympus lenses and a tripod or a flash, yeah, that works for me. You know, I, I'm okay. fine with that. As long as your purchase is 5,000 or more or 3,000 or more, you know, can't be, uh, I don't want you to get, well, I got one Sony lens and one camera Olympus body. This is someone who is converting and wants to learn and use it. I don't care if you own other gear, but I want your purchase to be for Olympus. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed. You will not be disappointed. And that kind of stacks with their promotion. Aren't they doing a promotion right now where if you buy like the three lenses, you get the body for free? And that's like an easy way to do it. That so would be like, an we're easy getting way to do it. July 5th is the last day, though. So you only have three days left to get down to the camera shop and do this. If you buy the uh, 17, I'm sorry, the uh, 7 to 14 2.8 Pro, which is a spectacular lens. If you buy the 40 to 150 uh, lens, uh, which is this one. Uh, which, by the way, with the two times on it, basically I'm shooting at uh, I'm shooting at 160 to 600 millimeters. This is, uh, I think, one of the best lenses I've ever owned. As you see, massive. You know, here's my hand on this thing. I broke my 300 in the Galapagos on about the fourth day. This was all I had. Never missed a shot. Never missed a shot. And then you get the 300 f/4, which is just a phenomenal prime lens. You get these three lenses, you get a 1DX. Now, you can pick any body. Go for the 1DX. It's got the built-in vertical grip, the dual batteries. I mean, it's just uh, the perfect wildlife uh, camera. It was the first macro uh, four-thirds body that I ever thought came close for professional wildlife and uh, landscape photography. Or wildlife. Landscape, there's some other systems out there, but I do more than that. So, for me, you buy these three lenses, you get a free Holy cow. If I didn't already have all three of those lenses, I, I won't lie. I thought, well, gosh, that's not a bad deal anyway. So uh, that's a phenomenal deal. And there's also other combinations and savings out there. So honestly, you, you won't have any problem. You can get you a full system. And here's the cool thing. You spend $5,000. You're not walking away with one lens 
Yeah. You're walking away with multiple lenses. And here's the here's another great thing. And it will fit in one, one backpack. airport carry-on bag. <laughs> one. No more paying $200 of flight fees with a giant Pelican case and all that. It'll fit in one carry-on bag. So, yeah, that's a pretty good deal. That's awesome. Um, and I really appreciate you offering that. And I and I didn't think about that. It's like, man, we could stack that offer. You get free education time with with Lee, and you can you can get a free camera based upon what purchase you get. So that's right. Um, that's right. Yeah, and and, and I want you know, Camera Shop didn't ask me to do this. Olympus didn't ask me to do it. I did it because a I know the value. I can tell you what the camera shops how wonderful they've been to me, and I I'd never worked with them before. Everybody I've met is super friendly, super nice. Uh, don't order it from Amazon. Don't go to your camera store. These guys know what they're doing. Buy it from them. I wouldn't make that offer through through any other channel like that. But because of how good they've been, how incredible a company Olympus is to me, I, I just want to help support that. I want to help support you, the customer. Yeah, I, and, and I can't thank you enough. On behalf of the camera shop, I can't thank you enough. And even our customers who, who uh, you know, happen to take advantage of that, I really appreciate it, Lee. Sure, um, sure. Kind sure. words. Kind words, my friend. Um, so I, I just, uh, you know, we normally just ask an hour from, you know, our, our, our special guests like yourself. Uh, we're coming up on 56 minutes. Uh, do you still have some more time or is I, because I, there was, I, I, I don't have anything else. So if you want to keep asking me questions, I'm happy to help. Okay. Uh, hear what I have to say. <laughs> I mean, that, is that, I think anyone, I know, I know I'm my mother's son and I could keep talking forever because I, I've always got something to share, whether you want to hear it or not. Right. Sure. So Maybe share some images if you like. Yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of um, I would love to, for you to share some images. Um, one thing I would kind of share is, um, you know, we've got your workshop coming up on Thursday. Again, that we're reiterating that we've got the workshop That's coming right. up on Thursday um, and we can get more details when we close here on that. But what are some, you know, what are some of the tips and tricks? And I guess with showing some of your images, what are some of the things that as like a teaser, like tuning into the workshop, what are some things that we can expect? What are, what are, what are some nuggets of knowledge that you could pass on to people, um, you know, that will help them if they can't tune in on Thursday? What, what are some things that you can kind of right. leave people with? Early on in photography, well, maybe not early on, maybe in the middle time of, of my photography experience in my life thus far, I wanted to do it all. I want to do macro birds, wildlife, landscape all at once. And what I found out was I got a lot of mediocre shots. So now what I tend to do is I, I, I was talking to Justin earlier about it. I tend to go through seasons of photography here in the Big Bend area. And because, you know, uh, macro ramps up macro and summer storms, lightning out here in summer is spectacular. Birds spring and early summer are great and winter. There's some cool landscape stuff in winter, but I go through these seasons. And so what I do now, what I tend to do now, unless I'm leading a workshop in the Galapagos or Amazon where people want to photograph as much as I can. When I'm out on my own, I say, I'm going to go do macro. I'm going to go do bird. I'm going to go do landscape or, or mammals or whatever it is. The more you hone in and focus rather than trying to carry 80 pounds of gear and do all these different things is, Set aside a day, a half day, whatever it is, you know, and focus on that style of photography. Now, I won't lie. There's been some times I looked over at the light or the subject and went, oh, gosh, you know. But what I've learned is at the end of the day, if I have one spectacular shot, I will take that over 500 good shots. One spectacular shot makes my day over 500 good ones. Now, again, I know when you travel somewhere, you might never get to go again. You want to try to capture as much as you can. I, I, I understand that. But places where you go a lot, focus. Focus your mind. Focus your body. Focus your gear. And say, today, I am going to go bring other people into the world of an insect. Or I love photographing venomous snakes. I keep them photograph venomous snakes. I, I want to show people the, the, the uniqueness of a rattlesnake today. Or today, like coming up here in June, July, I mean, in uh, July, August, September, the hummingbirds in my yard, it's, it, it, I, I don't need drugs. I've got, I've got these seasons where I get my highs off the lightning right now in the monsoons and then the hummingbird migration coming through. And you capture that shot 
uh, I had a lady doing a capture the hummingbird workshop. She had never done high speed photography. And I don't just do natural backgrounds. I love back, black backgrounds. I do white backgrounds. And some of my birding friends, I don't like the white. Yeah, well, interior designers do. That's what I'll tell you. So I love shooting a white background because all you see is the, the individual as an individual. And so I set her up. She wanted to try black background. And a male Lucifer's hummingbird came up. Click. And she goes, oh, look at this. When I walk over, I'm like, oh, my God, that's what I would love. And she, this is her first time. She Within five minutes, she got a shot that even I was like, oh, that's killer. And she, and she goes, I said, well, later, if you want to change it, she goes, oh, no, I like the black. I said, I understand why. So, you know, I go through seasons, focus. Some days I look over and I see a great rainbow, but I've got my macro gear and I go, you know what? I'm just going, frankly, we get some rainbows out here. I don't even stop and shoot them all. And I go, you know what? I'm going to enjoy that for the rainbow that it is, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to go on the film today because today was about capturing some beetles or today was about the common black hawks that are nesting and feeding their young focus don't try to do it all master that day that time master it become a master at it my photography frankly in my skill and my results went up exponentially when i started doing that when i started doing that because i i i, I would skip oh i don't want to take the time but sometimes if you want the great shot, you go, you know what? Forget about rushing. Forget about this. Take the time. Get set up right. Get your composition correct. Check your four corners. Slow down and get that one shot that makes you go, oh, yeah. And so what if you got 500 good ones? I'll take the one spectacular any day of the week. So make that trade off and focus. Focus. Don't worry about it. I need a 28 to 300 millimeter lens. No, you don't. No, you don't, because what you're going to end up with is a lot of mediocre shots. Focus. Focus that day. Take out uh, – here, here's another thing, another tip, another teaser. For much of my early photographic experience and journey, whenever we see a grandiose scene before us, and Big Bend is full of, you know, spec desert mountains. Oh, my God, that just gets me so excited. You know, I love desert mountains. You see this grandiose scene, and our first thing we think is – Big grandiose, big wide angle lens. And then you take a picture and you look and there's this tiny little pathetic scene in front of you. And you're like, it, that doesn't capture. Start playing around with long lens panoramics. I, you don't need to tell, listen, I really right stuff. Probably didn't want to contact me today after this, but you don't need a thousand dollar nodal gear in a panoramic <laughs> bracket. Yeah. I hand hold to go click, click, click. Two and three rows, 25, 30 image long lens panoramic shots and, and, and pull those images together. And what happens is you take this big grandiose scene and you keep it big and grandiose and you pull the viewer into that scene. Whereas before with your little 18 millimeter, 14 millimeter, 7 millimeter lens, those mountains went from, oh my gosh, to, oh, oh yeah, that's really <laughs> So Use your eyes. Your eyes are basically, as we know, 50 millimeters. If you're looking at a scene and what you want to photograph is smaller than your eyes fill the view, grab a longer lens. Grab a longer lens. A, a long lens panoramic is going to pull the viewer of your image into the scene, not push them away. Now, if you're standing at the foot of the mountains and you have to turn your head like this to see the scene you want to photograph, by all means, pull out your wide angle lens. But it is so rare for me to ever see a 70 millimeter and above. You know what I love about the 40 to 150, even with a 1.4 on it? This is often my go to landscape lens in Big Ben. You can see tons of my rain shots, my lightning shots, my everything. I took a, I had a, the other day with live composite, I had the, the 12 to 40 millimeter lens on a 1DX, and I had the 40 to 150 on the Mark III. Live composite. I, I put the tripods at different heights. I captured the same lightning bolt and the, the way, and you know, it's the same lightning bolt, but it looks, it, it's a very different experience in both images, mm -hmm. very different experience. So pull out your long lens for grandiose scenes and take some long lens panoramics. And I can teach you how to do that in Big Ben. And it's a lot simpler than you realize. And I would say that 95% of them I do or don't touch a, a tripod or a nodal system, or a gigapan, or, you know, I'm sorry, companies, but I don't need them. I don't need them. 
I mean, it, they're, they're tools that probably help you, right? But they can help people. They yeah. can help people a lot. But uh, if I, if I still shot full frame stuff, yes, I would have some of those. I sure would. I sure would. But with my Olympus gear, I I just shoot a bigger area than I want because the image stabilization is so great. I can click. I, uh, another feature I've even talked about is you know the the high res shots that you can. Oh do yeah, the high res mode, handheld high res megapixel, right? So imagine you got to be a little patient, take a picture. I'm patient. I let it process. So I'm doing 50 megapixel long lens panorama. Oh, wow. wow. Yes. Yeah. Now you got to be able to hold the, you know, you got to remember where your last shot was and move it, but then you piece that together and you're just like, Holy cow. So that would be a, a little teaser, I would say. And I'm also going to talk about stuff that most people don't think about when it comes to wildlife photography. Most people, all of a sudden see a moment and they try to capture it. I am going to talk about how to be present and think about what you want to capture and then let it happen and capture it, not just stumble upon it. And there's a big difference in the two. There's a big so it's, difference. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like creating the opportunity to capture the decisive moment. So kind of yes. bridging the you know what Stephen Shore talks about. Stephen uh, Shore uh, has a book. Um, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, um, but I remember it was something that we had to read in school. And he talks about all the layers of photography. You know, there's the there's the physical layer, which is like what are we printing on? What is the final uh, product going to look like? And then there's the there's the depictive layer, which you know is like talking about the like what are, what are the actual kind of like the compositional elements of the photograph, and then there's the mental layer, which is the the, the third uh, level, and it's kind of talking about you know is it make is it asking the who what where and how because images can be depictively deep and mentally shallow like there's not much to think about here, or they can be like a street photographer. Um, it can be mentally deep because like, what are we looking at? What is the moment that we're looking at? Is there any kind of angst or anguish or any emotion that we're seeing in it? And then finally, there's the, you know, the four is the mental modeling is kind of just having that foresight of where are we going to set up to set up that up that, that opportunity. So keeping all these four things in mind and kind of creating that opportunity when you go out to shoot, because it's, it's more like, like what you're saying. It's more so just, Hey, yeah, you can go out and just get lucky and it's something that you're kind of talking about earlier, it's it's you're trying to qu create quality over quantity. And it's it's easy to burn through a thousand shots. But what we're what I like to encourage people to do, and it sounds like what you like to encourage people to do is, you know, you know, my photographers in school, the teachers, they said, hey, you could go out with a roll of film, shoot 100, shoot 100 images. And if you walked away with one image, you did a good job. And and the thing is, is try to let's try to increase the the success rate of that roll of film. You know, when you only get 24 or 36 shots, slow down the process, slow it down. And that's why I went to school and shot with film, because with a four by five camera underneath the, and the world is upside down and backwards, quite literally, you know, and, and it costs you five dollars per sheet just to get the sheet of film even processed. Right. Yeah. You you want to take your time with those shots, and you want to create. And it sounds like what you want to do is is create the building blocks for building. Uh, you know, setting up for opportunity. Like if you do all these things, you're creating the opportunity. You're not looking for the opportunity. You're creating it. And and I will tell you that you know Brian Peterson talks about. A, a technically correct exposure in the creatively correct exposure. And I want to give him credit because I think that his understanding exposure book was a huge uh, influence on my photography in that I see lots of technically correct images on Facebook groups, Instagram, whatever that bore the crap out of me. I've got lots of technically correct boring shots in my, in my Lightroom catalog but the reality is, is there are shots that can move you or make you stop and think or bring quotes to mind or help you enter the world of that animal or that person or that moment or that event. And when we pursue that, a lot of times it's it's anticipation. Like I'm constantly looking at the clouds out here and I'm not even necessarily thinking about what's the photograph right now, but what might the photograph be in an hour? What might the photograph be in two hours? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have been, uh, you know, there's nothing more painful than when you have like a brand new photographer with you and you're going on a landscape tour and you've got a great blue sky 
not a cloud in there. And inside you go, this is going to be a rough day, boys. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, it's great. It's perfect. we got a complete <laughs> sky. You're like, oh, how do you tell them, hey, on a day like this, if it were just me, I'd be doing macro. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. learning to anticipate. There's been mornings I walked out of the house and I thought I was going to go do landscape. And immediately I went back and go, nope, I'm going to be doing this because I was anticipating what was going to happen. So photographers are all too much. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times you're driving along a road or you're hiking and you look over and the moment is like, you know, Chevy Chase and Christmas vacation with the Christmas tree. <laughs> you know, it's lit up. There's glitter. You go, oh, my gosh, I have to capture this now. I remember there's a there's a beautiful overlook in Big Bend National Park where I love to take clients for sunset. God race came down on Kit Mountain. And I knew those, I knew what was happening couldn't be more than a minute and a half in length. And my clients went, well, now would you? And I'm like, right now you should <laughs> just press the button. And cause I love, obviously I love answering questions, but right now you just shoot. And in a minute and a half, when this is gone, then you ask questions. So she goes, okay. I said, just keep shooting. Cause it's going to change for a minute and a half. And then we're going to lose this. And sure enough, minute and a half. And it was one of my favorite images of 2019 probably. And it lasted a minute and a half. And I told her what was just, just shoot. I mean, we all have that yeah. and that's where you got to be quick, you know, you know, but I'm still going to talk about anticipation that makes it easier to be ready in the moment to capture it when it happens. Then all of a sudden going, Oh, crud. I, I, I don't have the right. Lane. Oh, I don't have. That's one of the, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Okay. And that's good. And we had, um, we had a question here while uh, while you were talking. This goes back to your panos. Uh, when shooting a pano of several lines, do you shoot vertical or horizontal? Yes. <laughs> um, I do both. I love vertical, but when I, because I'm doing long lens, the whole horizontal vertical issue is not as big a deal. So a part of it is if I have to use a slower shutter speed, then I might go more horizontal to make it easier to hold the camera more still. I, I prefer vertical. It depends on in my in my mind what do I want this image to be. If I see it more as a because when I shoot also vertical panoramics, I might do three shots in a row up. I might do eight shots in a row up. It, it kind of depends in that moment. I probably shoot equal fifty percent both ways with long lenses. With as my lens as my focal length shortens. I would probably go to vertical more just to help with the distortion. My, uh, when I'm, when I'm blending the images in Lightroom, there's no one projection I always use because some look great. It depends on how I stood. It might depend on how tight my arc was or how, how straight my arc was. So I don't always say, well, always go with perspective or always go with uh, uh, spherical or whatever. It depends. Uh, it's not black and white for me. It is in the moment. If I've got a strong breeze, I might prefer to go horizontal just to be able to pull that lens in a little tighter, hold the camera a little more firm to make sure I've got that shot. Because I often like stormy panoramic. So, you know, I've got dust blown or whatever. I'm not afraid to do it on a tripod, too, if I think if I think my handhold shots are, aren't going to work. You know, I, I'm not afraid to stick my, my Olympus on a tripod if I need to. I, I own probably three tripods. I've got a a Kirk Enterprise tabletop, you know, the one made for a window, but I use it as a tabletop. So I've got a wide variety of stabilization. So handheld isn't always the answer, depending on the circumstance. And that's, that's a good answer. I know my buddy out in, uh, I was going to ask you, because you were talking about, Mon uh, uh, was it Southwest Colorado you do? Yes. Uh, oh, that's my favorite part of Colorado is that corner. Because uh, you, you do a fall, you do a fall color tour out there, right? That's what you're saying? I do, I do, I do how, 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 how how close to Carbondale or um, Montrose is that? So where Montrose is, I go down more toward Ridgeway and Ure, that area. Yes, yes, like yes. That, uh, yeah, on, my buddy, I'll take Black Canyon to the Gunnison over Grand Canyon uh, in terms of places I'd rather see. Uh, I, know, I know that's heresy amongst many, but that's just me. But that corner is my favorite part of Colorado. I've covered all, virtually the whole state, but there's something about that area that is just special for me. Uh, great memories, great trips, beautiful scenery. And yeah, it's, I, I, I generally don't like going to your stereotypical spots, but what I do is before I go over for the fall foliage, 
I spend a couple of days at Great Sand Dunes National Park doing black and white. Oh, I'm a black and white guy, by the way. The desert. Uh, so here might be another little lead in. Develop your own style. Don't worry about how many likes you get. The image I sold for the most money ever, a lot of money, got very few likes on Facebook, almost none. And I, my aunt was with me. She'd never been to Big Ben. I said, hold on. I have to hop out and get this panoramic. And I love it. And man, the, the client got an eight foot panoramic. And I was just like, oh, I wish I had a wall big enough in my house here for an eight foot panoramic. Because when I saw it, it was spectacular. That's huge. Black and white, if you're trying to communicate emotion, if you're trying to communicate texture or ruggedness, the desert, it screams for midday black and white. I got into butterflies and dragonflies because birds stink in the middle of the day. But dragonflies and butterflies are great in the middle of the day. I got into black and white because the color in the desert sometimes takes your focus and your mind off of what should be communicated in that scene. You want them to see the thorns of the cactus and the, and the, the ruggedness of the rocks and the texture of the grasshopper and the, 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 the detail in the clouds. And color just simply distracts you from that. Mm -hmm. If you think about many of the most poignant photojournalism images that we've ever seen, uh, the capture battle or uh, memory, you know, Kent State, she, whatever it is, it's black and white images. And, and it's because it removes all the distraction and it brings the emotion to the forefront. So, oh my goodness, black and white, don't be afraid of it. I mean, so great sand dunes national park and black and white. Ah, oh, my goodness. It, it, sometimes black and white takes a boring, horrible image and makes it a spectacular image. There's no other way to, to say it. Yeah. And I, and I love how you're talking about how uh, the color can be distracting, removing that because, you know, and that's one fun thing I've actually, you know, being an Olympus shooter myself and, you know, having an EM one, two with a 12 to 100 pro and oh. having, the, and having, I mean, that's a beautiful combination. It's an even that better is. combination with the EM one three, the yes. EM one three with that oh, combination yeah. is just, just crazy. Um, but what I've loved is I, you know, I was kind of, I, I, I used to hate the art filters and I used to always kind of just like, I don't know why Olympus puts this on here. They should put the scene modes back in the dial. That would be like my only thing is somehow reintegrate the scene mode so I can just select from them. Uh, but I tell you. Yeah, on the EM1X and the EM13, I think you can yeah. go to, it's like a color profile. So they have been able to sneak it back in. You just have to kind yeah. of back, you have to backdoor it in a sense. Yeah, that's true. Um, but one of the things I love is that, um, you know, I've only shot, I, you know, I used to shoot film in college because, uh, again, I wanted my my mom kind of uh, she 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 kind of helped get me into photography. She was just an artist in the family. And I remember in college, black and white film. And so it was kind of like, hey, you know, I want to mess around with this a little bit. And they had the grainy black and white one. And I just I, I I've been messing around in Nick software and changing stuff to kind of the the embryo types or something like that, just to give it a little bit of color. So it wasn't, you know, cyana. Uh, a sepia tone, you know, yeah. and, and man, I can do blue. I can do indigo blue, you know, underexposed by two thirds of a stop uh, with a grainy, nice look. And, and I've been, I've been shooting that stuff with the Olympus and it makes it easier to do it. Now I start to see myself, I'm branching out. I've lately, I've been shooting in, in pop color too. And, and last night I was shooting with the instant film on, uh, on the lake. Uh, Cause I got to go on this boat ride with another customer, Olympus shooter who invited me out and uh, I just we were using those modes. I, I even used like the the cross process one just because it had this nice kind of muted tone to it. And and it's just I just love what it can do uh, for your images. And 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 going back to what you're talking about, how it removes the color um, really makes it about more the elemental stuff in the in the image. You know, you have to focus on the textures. You have to focus on the emotions. And um, and man, there's nothing better than you know, shooting like a roached out rusty wall or something in black and white or, or you know, some kind of textury wall um, or, or plants or, you know, plants or, or dead plant life. You know, it just really kind of brings it to life. So Well, and, and what it does is it expands your photographic opportunities. I mean, if all you're doing is color landscapes, yeah. you're done early in the morning and you don't start until late in the day. But suddenly black and white, your whole day is opened up, you know, yeah. and in the summertime here. The, we have we have phenomenal clouds virtually every day of the summer, and I can take you to to you know limestone or igneous or metamorphic rock, 
with different textures. I can take you to the lowlands. I can take you to the highlands. And you're going to be able to capture some incredible shots when most people, they're not even out photographing, you know? Well, and then you get the high contrast from the sun, especially on a, on a like today right now, it's there's no overcast. It's just straight blue sky. So when you have hard light like that, hard light is just going to, so it's gonna it's gonna make your texture sing like crazy right. and all uh, my all my uh black and white conversion all of it is done in uh silver effects pro in the nick collection oh and that it, software now are you still using the old google version or did you spring for the for no, the new stuff? no i'm a i'm a keep up to date guy okay and so so no and although that one did a great job. If you still have it, honestly, it's going to do a great job. Over time, I'm I'm the nerd that read a book. You know, I, I learned the whole thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the control point thing, it's a little, it's good, but I wish it was a little more refined. But the, the reality is, is I've now mastered all the controls to the point that I know it, I can be in and out of Nick effects in under 30 seconds and have an image work, boom, right where I want it and love it. <laughs> And now, and, and it, so it, it is much better um, after DxO, Mark, picked it up. That it sounds like you're using the DxO version. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't mess with the color one. I don't mess with virtually any other thing, but it makes it, frankly, the silver effects loan. I will go into the HDR. I don't shoot HDR a ton. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd rather, it's, it, not that I have any issues. I do it sometimes. And, of course, the, Olymp the Olympus will do it in camera. But for silver effects pro alone, I would buy it just for yeah. that. That's and that's re that's really why I picked it up was just to if I wanted to convert to black and white, I had that attribute. And and what's nice is that a, you know since I was doing these um, cyanotypes essentially in Nick software, you know the Olympus camera just allows me to do it in camera. So now I just shoot you know super fine JPEG on the on the on the black and white one or grainy black and white, and that's that's all I do. And actually, I just post straight to. Um, what I do is I shoot it in two three on purpose, and I once I'm done, I just post straight to my my website if I'm going to to use them for for sale shots. So, um, just w anything to stream uh, streamline the process, right, Lee? Well, I'm a control freak, so <laughs> I never shoot. I, I'm one of those that I know I can do it better than the camera or the the software in the sense that. So I'm a control freak, so I shoot neutral on my camera. Mm -hmm. I shoot. I don't want it applying anything unless I'm using one of the special tools, which I, you know, I am a complete control freak. So give me the most muted blah raw file. And then I want to work with my canvas uh, in that sense, only because it's only because I'm kind of OCD. So uh, I, I guess some people probably say I'm more than a little OCD because I'm a control freak. I want, I want to know that my final image is what I did. I mean, I want it to look like what happened, but I just don't trust somebody else or something, you know, I have people contact me, would you like someone to edit your images? Uh, no, never, ever, ever would I ever want anybody to do that. So for me, it's just a part of my personality type. And um, uh, Trevor did ask again, he says, hey, is silver effects um, like using presets is what he said here. And I kind of I kind of answered him. I said, yes, it is. But with more controls. And I said, it's Nick Collection by DxO Mark. But can you add a little bit about that real yes. quick? So what you'll do is you will find that you might have five or six or seven of the presets that you like as starting points, and then you can make those favorites. So you're not having to sort through the 40 or 50. You'll get it down to five or six. And then so I have my five or six or seven, and I have two or three that I tend to start with. And then I know the controls over on the right very well. Amplify blacks, whites, you know, increase highlights, or or I know what will produce grain. I know what will produce uh, more of a gritty feel with the uh, oh the term they used just left me. What's the slider that not the uh, it'll come to me in a minute. And so oh, the, I start the grain. The, the, grain? the grain. They don't call it the structure. I think they call structure. it structure. Yep. Yeah. The structure's up at the it's up at the top it's next to contrast top and top brightness. Top so what I do is then I work. So I, I start with my favorites and I click through and then I go through over here and add my refinements. Uh, and, and so that's how I do it. I will, I know where my starting point, it's, it's probably going to be one of three and occasionally it's one out of those other seven, but I know that's probably what I'm going to like. And, but then I know I'm going to click the color filters because Every time you click one of those color filters, it completely changes the message of that image. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So you don't, I don't rush through that. Click, undo, click, undo. Okay, boom. That makes my sky seem more sinuous. I mean, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, makes it seem more foreboding. Mm-hmm. Or if I want the foreboding to be in the cactus and the rocks, then, I, you know, I, it depends on the message I want to communicate. Uh, and so that's what I do with it. That's my my workflow with, with uh, Silver Effects Pro is, Right click, export into uh, directly into uh, or edit in Silver Effects Pro. Start with one of my favorites and then work from top to bottom on the refining. On the refining. Okay. Uh, did you have any images you wanted to share real quick with us? Sure. sure. Let me uh, let me click on share my screen here, and we will go to screen two. And this is a good opportunity, guys. If you have any questions for us as you're tuning in. Uh, feel free to throw us, throw them at us here. And yeah, me and I will be happy to answer them. I, I actually, I love this shot. We used this for our, our Instagram story uh, today. And I, and I loved how, uh, how Jonathan had set it up and man, it's now I, I'm, I'm just going to guess real quick, just because this is what I like to do with photos. I mean, they taught okay. us in, they taught us in school uh, to really look at a photograph and figure out how it was shot and based upon some of the things you already talked about today, I'm just going to kind of throw out a real quick guess that um, you've got a hummingbird feeder nearby. You're setting up outside. You've got a, a, a black backdrop that you like to kind of uh, pop in and have set up somewhere. And this is just 100% natural light. You're not using any flash or strobe? Nope. So I do have a black background. But in this case, for black, I don't hit it with any light because you'll, if you're using one with – texture the texture will show up yes if you're yep. using acrylic you might get reflections i have both black acrylic uh i've tried black fiberboard but it tends to be more gray mm-hmm. with no light hitting it so i experiment I, I mean i want it i want this to be you know completely 255 55 55 right um i'm sorry yeah that's right so this is actually probably a six strobe setup okay so you are using a lot of lights I am. I uh, There are other hummingbird photographers that like a lot of shadow and their high speed stuff. I want you to see all aspects of that individual bird. I, I want every piece of information to be brought out. Handheld with my Olympus. That is the 300 with no teleconverters. And I'm using, um, you know, a wireless system. And so I try to put as many flashes nearby. My flash settings would probably start at 1 16th power or 1 32nd. Okay. I, I, I prefer to use more flashes and a lower power than fewer flashes and higher power just to help get that stop. And uh, I do have a feeder nearby, but unlike a lot of people, I will put, I will put the background uh, generally horizontally. I'll get a bigger background. And I will put a feeder on one side and a flower on the other so I can quickly – and I'll make sure my flashes equally cover both sides. So I often have the option of shooting at either. I think it's a fantastic shot. I mean, it's it's beautifully lit. Had I not known about the flash, I mean, it, it's it, – I don't know if Richard Averdon was one of the first people to do that, but he – you know, he – he took a lot of people out to the desert or would shoot people on a white wall and create those nice natural high keys just with natural light. And when you can do that just by, you know, try, trying to do it without flash um, is just is just one cool effect that you can do. But, man, I, the, the technique of kind of throwing that all in and making it like a studio, like, well, hey, yeah, did Lee, did you go into a studio? And they like, you know, flight of the bumblebees. We're just going to let all these guys out of the cages and just go. This, and by the way, um, it looks like you could almost cut it out in Photoshop and stuck it on black background. The way you get that effect is to make sure you have one flash behind the bird. You have to separate the, the bird from the background. So when you're doing a black background or even a white one, I tend to like to have a flash behind the bird shooting at it. And that gives you that separation that almost looks like, but I, I'm one of those, I really don't like Photoshop. I only go in there. This bird, ironically enough, flew very close to a flash that I got a little bit in the image, and I did have to go in, and I do use Photoshop uh, because it's just a little better at removing larger items, so I did need to do that for this shot. But I love this shot, the beauty of this bird. I love Rufus Hummingbird, so this is one of them that I really like from last year. 
it, well, it's got it's it's a nice color palette, and it's you know it, you got good angles. I mean, the way that the the wings are, you know, it's it's creating that shape of an X kind of in the middle of the uh, of the image. Uh, right. You know, Mike Amico, uh, he he tuned in. He said, "I'm putting the camera down. I think I'll focus on guitar and uh, from here on out." <laughs> That's great. Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, All right. All oh, right. This is great too. So Olympus. So everybody who goes, oh, I'm not getting great stuff with the Mark II compared to the Mark III. Really? Because this is an OMD One Mark II, which is on sale right now in a phenomenal image. So I actually have two 60 millimeter macros because I love the depth of field with the Olympus system. This is sitting on a high speed Cognosis uh, stop shot. This is in a flight cage, an acrylic flight cage. This is all lit by flash, uh, a false background. This is taking, this image was taken about, I don't know, seven, eight feet from where I'm sitting right now in my living room. This is a Polisti species of paper wasp. And you can see the incredible depth of field I get. So it flies through a laser, it triggers the system. I have a 150,000 second external shutter, high speed shutter from Cognizance. It opens it, it fires the flashes, it closes it, and it puts my camera back in bulb mode. And it, I, I only let the bulb mode sit for 20 seconds, and if it doesn't take a picture, it starts a new one, so noise doesn't build up. But this was cropped some, and then I run it through Topaz Labs Gigapixel to add some pixels back in. I do have an affiliate link for Topaz. Uh, honestly, I will say Topaz Gigapixel and their uh, their – uh, the not noise reduction, but the uh, stabilizer one is is magic. It's magic. I didn't believe in it at first. I tried it, and I'm a I'm an absolute believer. So this was a cool shot taken. Um, just just uh, I don't know April I think here in my living room. And that was was that a spray painted background like a like, no, no? I, I take intentionally blurry shots for fake backgrounds. And you and okay so you'll you'll. You'll throw the clutch on the Olympus. You'll take some shots of something natural, print it out, and put it back there. Yes, and and, okay. and I don't put backgrounds – like I won't take a background shot in the Amazon and use it for a insect from home. So mm -hmm. my out-of-focus shots from home are used for the local insects. If I'm doing something else, you know, I'll do that because I want – I create a lot of sets in my white box, and I use – you know, I, I, I was just I've been helping a PBS nature special that's being filmed on the wildlife of Big Ben and we'll create some sets. I'll say, no, 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 that he'll go grab some grass and say, no, that grass isn't found where that animal is. So let's make I want it to be accurate for it. nice. And that's that's really that's really great that you're doing that. Mike had this. He had to share one more thing. He said, these are awesome. Can't wait to see the presentation next week. Thanks, Lee. And Justin, he's off to a class. Cheers. Oh, so cool. thanks, Mike, for tuning in. Yeah, Appreciate yeah. that. Thanks, Mike. And, Shoot. And and Trevor's a fan. He says super shot of the wasp. So oh, thanks thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about for wildlife. There are you can see this was middle of the day, and this was one of my favorite shots. Uh, by the way, I do take lots of shots. I think on my Amazon workshop, I probably had twenty five, thirty thousand images because I push the limits, and I know I want super sharp shots. So here's a spider monkey swinging. And one reason at times I take a lot of shots is most people didn't capture this expression that he made. And if this were in color, his expression in those eyes would not be as powerful. Uh, this one will probably, I'll probably enter this in Nampa expression or showcase this year, because this to me is all about the character of a black faced spider monkey in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. And you, you feel like you're encountering this guy as an individual versus the color of the rainforest and everything like that. You see this, you think, oh, yeah, he reminds me of my eight-year-old stepson. He's a character, you know. So sometimes black and white is also better for wildlife. It, it, it shows the texture of his face, of his eyes, of his hair um, is, is just, to me, much more powerful in this image. And Trevor also uh, added that he loves the great 3D depth on, on that monkey. So this is getting out of that. I'm sorry, I accidentally touched the button. This is one of the benefits of a micro, a macro four thirds system. Is uh, micro four thirds is you get greater depth of field. So I can shoot shallower with my Olympus system than I could with my Canon, and still get that same depth of field. A lot of people think it's a negative. I'm like, oh no, no, no. Here's the beauty of it. 
I can shoot at 5.6. They need to be at 7.1, and we're still getting the same depth of field. Mm -hmm. Again, this is in a skiff floating, uh, and the image stabilization helped. I probably had four shots of this facial expression, but this was the sharpest because I'm standing up. People are moving. You know, the boat's moving. So, and, of course, great uh, local guides who help hold the boat still and in the current and whatnot. But as you can see, that's a very sharp image. Well, and, and you also mentioned like the, the depth of field factor um, with that being at a, an advantage. You know, the other advantage is, too, is that they have to kick their ISO up. You can keep your ISO down and your shooting settings because you That's can right. technically get more light That's and right. have more depth of field. So you could shoot at 2.8 for a flower. Um, yes, that's going to have minimal depth of, you know, that has like a depth of field of maybe like F4 or something like that. But that means that you can shoot at a, you can shoot at a 60th of a second and maybe crank it all the way down to like maybe 200 ISO 200 right. or something where somebody might have to crank it up to, you know, 400 to get the same shot. So, you know, that is one of the, I would say one of the benefits is that you can still let in more light, have the lower ISO where all these other people, you know, yeah, full frame. That's great that you have full frame, but you have the, you have the weight. And then you're gonna have, to, and then you're gonna have the, 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 you know, the the F8 with the higher ISO, and you might have to exercise more grain, you know, uh, compensation in your post production. And and my starting ISO for almost every shot, I started ISO 800. That's my default. That's nice. my default. Yeah, it does such a great job. I don't have to worry about. It. Now I'll go lower if I need to, or if I can, mm -hmm. that's no problem. But. So here again, this is where Olympus uh, just performs stellar. Now, one thing I will tell you that most photographers don't do is get dirty. I knelt down so I could be at eye level. This is a big, big headed anole in Costa Rica. I wanted the head to be in focus and the body out because of this, the light. The only light falling on this uh, was from my flash. You can actually see my hand, my homemade diffuser in its eye. Uh, I chose not to reduce it to a smaller point because I want people to see, hey, look, this is how I'm kind of shooting. And I love the light, the fall off in this image and the fall off of what's in in in, uh, in focus in, in my depth of field here. Because, again, you feel like this lizard is connecting with you visually versus if his feet were in focus or his body, it would distract you. I knelt down. I saw a lot. This guy was right on a trail. I mean, he was... I was probably, my lens was probably a foot and a half, you know, two feet at most from him. And I knelt down. I Most people try doing it at high ISO with just natural light. Nobody else has a shot. I wanted to, I, I had a Queen Rain flash where you can really bend the two. I just ordered the Olympus because I never had a macro, you know, the, the dedicated macro flashes because you could never pull the the flashes off easily and and adjust them well with the olympus when you can and it is on sale so i think it's down uh been delivered here uh and it's waiting for me because i can pull it off now and i won't have to use the queen ring which is not as reliable a, a flash but and and like and another reason i went for the olympus is i can adjust the power of each one independently and so here I wanted it soft on one side, brighter on the other to, to make it look like the light was coming left to right and hitting that eye. This was one of my favorite images from Costa Rica. I'm a reptile and amphibian guy too. I love it. And I love the, his face and the, and the colors and then the, the, the color on the tree back behind him. I love the way that kind of flows together. Yeah. And it's a great shot. And it's important to remember ratios, you know, when you're doing flash, you know, when you're talking about that movement from left to right is just kind of balancing the light. You know, you don't have to be one to one on each side. If you create a ratio one to two, one to four, you're creating that natural fall off of how light works. And that's what we're trying to do as photographers. We're trying to paint with light. And um, that's, right. it, that's what we want to focus on. And when you're a control freak, you like controlling all your light too. If you can. <laughs> Well, if you're if you're using flash, I hope that the, that's the case because that's flash right. is not that is not an easy thing to master. Yeah. You know what I'll say, but here's what I'll say about flash, and because this is true probably for all of us. In the beginning, let's be honest, flash is unbelievably intimidating. Mm -hmm. There's mathematics, there's physics. You just start going, oh. <laughs> but one of, one of the ways I'm wired in life is I like to try to take the complicated and explain it easy and make it easy. 
So I had a Nikon shooter at my house the other day. He wanted to do burrowing owls in the afternoon, but he wanted to do some macro. He had seen some of my clients' macro shots. Well, he didn't even have a Nikon macro lens. So I hooked him up with my Olympus stuff. I put it in my white box and I was teaching him. And, you know, within 30 minutes, 40 minutes, he was capturing prairie rattlesnake and some beautiful moth images. And I've got these gorgeous beetles up in my yard, up in my house. And he's getting phenomenal shots and realizing, oh, my gosh, this is so light. It's easy to handhold. And that flash doesn't have to be intimidating. If you just pick up a book and read it, which is how I generally learn, I won't lie. It is very intimidating. But there are ways to make intimidating very welcoming. And that's what I really like to do. So, man, if you want to learn flash, whether it be high speed or single, excuse me, single flash or macro flash, I love it. And, and I can walk you through physical exercises to make it actually much simpler. You know, here's an example of Costa Rica of a bird that without flash, you're not getting a shot. And without flash, his colors are bland, but it was raining. You can see the water droplets on his, on his uh, retresses, the tail feathers and on the bird's body and some on the bill, but the colors, I mean, you know, they're velvety. Uh, I always forget the, it's not the crimson colored uh, 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 toucanet. I think it's a different subspecies and I'm not up on the species here, but I threw this in because you realize, well, I, I had a man say one time, well, but the Olympus is only good to ISO 800. I said, really? And I showed him this shot, which I think is 3,200. And I'm like, really, the, the detail on those feathers aren't sufficient for you? So it's not only good to, uh, to ISO 800. Here's a black and white landscape from Big Bend National Park of Ernst Tanaha, which is one of my favorite black and white shots. Middle of the afternoon, I did do some control points to bring down the highlights in the back where the clouds weren't creating the shade. This Tanaha is so deep that mountain lions have been found drowned in it, deer, you know, animals come for drinks, but if you when you walk down to it, it's so steep that if you get in, you can't get out. So it's oh, the desert is so challenging. They finally find water, only to find that this particular water can often be a, a death trap for them. When I first got the when I first tried the Olympus shots, this was a, a spoon bill that flew over, and this is when I went down and I went, oh my goodness, I'm loving this. You know, handheld straight overhead. You know, I'd had to be hand holding the big 600 lens to try to capture the shot as the bird went overhead. But I would say the detail in that bird's eyes and everything are, are, are sufficient for me. Again, black and white, the turns, middle of the day, uh, the depth of field really makes this one turn. Let's face it, groups of birds can be very hard to get a great shot at. Groups of birds can be very challenging, particularly when you have large groups. But I cropped this one to a panoramic mode to bring the focus on the preening bird. I uh, got to get on a ranch with that TV show that nobody else ever gets on and was photographing over 70 desert bighorn from 30 yards away. And this youngster got all jacked up on Mountain Dew and hyper and playing. So I had fun shooting in low light, but capturing it and sharp. Pro capture mode, uh, find a butterfly sitting on a flower and half press and then wait for the for movement and capture shots. It would be very difficult with any other system. Oh, wow. wide, angle, wide angle hummingbird shots in uh, on our uh, Costa Rica trip. So love doing wide angle close ups of wildlife. So the Galapagos and, and this particular shot here, you know, your typical South Texas ranch. This is a juvenile crested caracara coming in. You know, oh, so nice. I just want people to see here are some of the examples of things you can do. White background with a hummingbird at a flower, you know. At this this shot, it's deciding to leave the flower and go over to the feeder. <laughs> Again, notice you can still see the detail in the white on the feathers. It's because I'm I'm backlighting the bird as well. If I weren't using a backlight, you won't get that separation, even though the whites are close. Even though the whites are close. So this is a white piece of acrylic, and I do hit white acrylic with flash. I want it blown out. I want this. Yeah. Like meet your neighbor style photography. Thunderstorms, dear Marfa. You know, let me get something different here. So we another wide angle hummingbird shot there in in uh, Costa Rica. <laughs> Are you sure that's not one of your clients on their adventure, their shooting adventure? Because it just kind of looks like it, it looks like something that you would see, 
you know, someone just kind of hanging out, like, you know, you, you went to visit a spot and someone's like, Oh, I'm tired. I'm going to sit down right here. And, uh, and, you know, I think this is the 12 to 40 millimeter lens. My lens is probably, so like I get real still, real patient. And my lens is probably, you know, three or four inches from this hummingbird. But the key is I know where to go where the hummingbirds are accustomed to people. And I like showing an animal in its habitat. Not every shot has to be a portrait. Mm -hmm. So here you get a feel not only for this hummingbird, but where it lives, what it does, how far up it's flown, you know, that it's up in the mountains and, you know, beautiful, nice, cool day. So uh, this, okay. So remember I told you the shot of the tricolored, one of the, the, this is one of the first images I ever took with Olympus system. That is one fifteenth of a second handheld. And the bird was about four feet away with it with at 840 millimeters. Wow. Nice and sharp, isn't it? Oh yeah. Oh uh, wow. I got crapped on a lot for this shot. So uh Bosky Dill Apache, where I want to start offering a workshop. I am uh, these birds are probably four to five feet from me because I think this was a I think this is about 100 millimeters. I, they were all, they had come right up to the shoreline and I knew I was going to get crapped on a lot. Like, <laughs> when the takeoff occurred, the wings were brushing my head and I just started firing and you could hear the poop falling. Hitting <laughs> my ear. Uh, but uh, man, oh. it, and you know, out of 50 shots, one of them had the birds in focus in a good spot. You feel like you're in the middle of this flock taking off with them. That's that. I mean, and you were talking about shooting lots of birds. This is, I've never seen anything like this. It's so chaotic. It's almost like one of those 3D images that you look at and you're waiting for the, the 3D image to kind of pop out of the background. Um, if, that, if the white snow goose were not in focus where it is, yeah. this would be a throwaway because that's what your eye goes to first. And then you go to the blue, to the blue morph snow goose there to the left. Yep. And then your eye makes a circle around this image. Because and, the first, and then because there's this hole that where everything's out of focus back. So you literally feel like you're one of the birds taking off looking up. Yeah. And that's and that's the biggest thing about some images is just being able to uh, create that movement. Like, you know, you got to land somewhere, your eye lands somewhere and now create some movement, move them through the image. So that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Yep. Yep. Uh, this is a juvenile red eyed uh, tree frog in uh, in. Yeah, so okay. they look very different from your adults. Oh wow! No, no focus stacking. This is an ant. I knelt down. Look, by the way, you want to be a get great macro shots. Buy pants that you don't mind getting the knees. Or I want to talk. I, I should. I shouldn't give away all my tips. So <laughs> tell me about getting some of my macro tips. But buy clothes you don't care if they get you know stained or whatever. But this is spectacular sharpness. Not focus stacked. Uh, and uh, again, this is using subtle flash. Again, another example of the depth of field that you get one shot. You know, yeah, I could focus stack this and get more, but ants are tough on focus stacking when they're alive. A woolly monkey peering out behind some leaves here. Uh, I left this one a little unsaturated because what I really wanted is uh, woolly monkeys have very funky eyes. And here, I like the fact he's peeking out behind the, the leaf. And I wanted you to, I didn't want the green leaves to be overpowering in this image. So I left the, I left it, I left it a little more contrasty than most people might make it. That's nice oh, emotion in that one. Yeah, owl monkeys. So this is one where the, the, the three workshop leaders, uh, another Olympus educator, Rob Knight, was with me. And then uh, Kevin of Wildside, who owns Wildside, who puts this trip together, was with me. All three of us shot Olympus. We all three got great, nice, sharp images. You could hear the frustration. One of our clients had spent 20 to 30 grand on Canon gear in the last few months. And he got home and he now has 20, 30 grand worth of Olympus gear and sends me emails, asking me questions all the time because they saw the back of our cameras like, oh. You could just hear, like, in a way you feel bad. Like, you're like, isn't that awesome? And I'm like, and then you go, now, I know you're not able to get this, but look at mine, you know. So, again, I've got the, the young one would pop out occasionally in between them. But this is uh, this is a very low uh, shutter speed, high ISO shot of owl monkeys and just a very moving moment to even get to see them, much less photograph. 
a caiman lizard and as a, a reptile guy this was an ecstatic sighting for me 300 millimeters and look at the detail on the eyes of that fly on top of his head you know you can see it just reminds me of a dinosaur <laughs> these are spectacular they're actually snail eating lizards they have very powerful jaws to crush the shells of snails uh they become quite popular in, in the in the uh in captivity because you could acquire snails to feed them but beautiful reddish and green and very large so here's an example you know sharpness doesn't always have to be the main thing when it comes to wildlife uh, i was sitting on the front of a skiff with rob the other olympus educator and we were doing beautiful colors at sunset on this skiff and these fish eating bats started flying around well if i wanted to freeze the bats i would have had no information at all it, it would have, wouldn't have worked but what you get the feel of is these bats, because this bat is probably three or four feet from the front of the boat, because I'm using the 12 to 40, which, by the way, I always thought the 7 to 14 would be my go-to landscape lens. I can honestly say the 12 to 40 probably comes out of my bag more for landscapes. And here I shot that, caught a bat right in the middle. Uh, we took, you know, we would use high sequential focus for the landscape and then just wait for the bats to come through and, and then look and go, oh, wow, this one's cool. So... Yeah, but that's about pre-preparation. We, we yeah. focus and expose for the landscape and then took a bunch of shots knowing that a lot of them we would miss it. But here I got the shadow the reflection and the bat just like I wanted. I actually photograph people every now and then. And this is one of my favorite shots from the Amazon. A high, uh, uh, this was a client. He's actually wearing one of our shirts, but he's a client. Uh, he basically shot point and shoot type cameras, the, the boat drivers behind him. And I looked back and I saw the color and, a, and one of my other clients had a flashlight and just briefly it passed over this client. I said, oh, I need you to do something. I want you to turn the power down on your flash. I need you to sit and hold it. And I asked him to look at me and I took a bunch of shots because I, I shot, you know, slow shutter speed on a moving boat. This is a moving boat at night with a very slow shutter speed. And when I saw this, I was like, Dad, gum, photographing people aren't that bad. I mean, you feel like you're exploring the Amazon when you look at this picture, you know. So this was one of my favorite shots from the whole uh, Amazon trip on this one because you see the silhouette of the boat driver. You know, it can almost be a real creepy shot too, like someone stalking you in the Amazon. But this one I loved. Uh, a white morph reddish egret fishing the other day with some really nice light. One of my favorite shots from Yellowstone in winter. I do a Yellowstone in winter. Uh, it's two thirds full. We only take six. You get your whole row to yourself. We're the only tour company that does that on the snow coaches. And this coyote stopped and howled. I intentionally high keyed it. I didn't want you to even see the texture in the snow. I just wanted your eyes to be solely on the, the, the coyote. I didn't want anything else to draw your eye. So. You know, there's a teaser. There's some of my images, and uh, I hope people have enjoyed it. You know, I don't know how much more time you want to go. I know you've been at work, too. I'm happy to go longer, but or if people have other questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. Well, we'll we'll, we'll leave the door open a little bit longer for, for questions if anyone wants to sneak them in. Um, but I guess the, you know, we talked about bookending some things here, Lee. Yes. Um, so you're, let's talk about your class one more time. What are we going to be covering? Is there any cost? What, what were some of the details on that? Okay. No, the webinar is free and it's, it's hosted by Olympus and the camera shop together. So you're going to get a chance to watch for free. It will be recorded. Uh, it'll be on big marker, the link. I know they've shared the link. If you go to the wild side nature tours channel, on big marker not only can you find that one you'll find other free webinars and some paid i've got a lightroom class out there so we would certainly appreciate any of your business there but i think you guys should really uh, particularly for you local clients for the camera shop it's pretty cool when camera shops will invest this much time energy and uh, a focus on allowing folks like myself to come you know it helps all of us and the reality is is Amazon is worthless when it comes to buying your camera gear because they can't answer a single question about it. And thank God for local camera stores where you have dedicated photographers who not only are out shooting, but they're there helping you. They could be out shooting, but they're at the store helping you buy the gear you need. So make sure to reward them for that. Um, as a local business owner and a small business owner myself, I can tell you the importance of loyalty. And yeah, you might save 50 bucks, but you're not getting a free 
a lesson from me on Amazon. You're not getting a chance if something's not working or to call up Justin and him go, oh, you probably have this setting on. You can't do that. So keep that in mind whenever you think you're going to save 50 bucks by going to Amazon or someone like that. So our webinar is free. It's a week from today. It will be on Bra uh, BigMarker.com. Uh, Mike Amico will be online with us as well, an Olympus rep. So you're going to get the free webinar, which I highly encourage you to do. Also, if you want to follow me uh, online, my Instagram is Big Ben Birding and, uh, and Photo Tours, Big Ben Birding Photo Tours. I have a Facebook page under Big Ben Birding and Photo Tours. But also, I do my international workshops through Wild Side Nature Tours that you can find on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we only do photography tours or birding tours. We don't mix the two. So photography is just that. It's photography focused on our Amazon workshop. There's a birding skiff and a photography skiff, and neither of the two mix. So we take photography very seriously. If you're an Olympus user, great. We can help you immensely, but we've all used other systems. So whether you're Nikon, Shooter, Canon, Sony, we can help you with all of those. We've all shot those systems at one point or another. So we don't only offer Olympus stuff. And we've all been... The combined experience between Rod, myself, and Kevin alone, plus we have other instructors, you're probably pushing easily a hundred and something years worth of photography experience there. So the Glaucus Islands, Kevin's been over 40 times, probably more than anybody other, any other photographer. So if you want to go international, we're definitely uh, wild side nature tours. I would definitely recommend if you want to come out to Big Ben, uh, I'm your local guy here. But please make sure to go into the camera shop and reward them for bringing you content like this. Uh, I, I think it's a great thing that they're doing. So very excited and very appreciative of Justin and his time today with me. And don't forget, if you go into the store and you buy $5,000 worth of Olympus gear or camera gear like your uh, you know, tripods or flashes, whatever else, that counts. Go in there. I'll give you two hours of free le online lessons split into one hour each because two hours is too much. You won't remember it all. And if you buy $3,000 <laughs> worth of gear, you'll get a one hour lesson. So the first one to do that uh, let them know that you watch this or you watch the webinar and we'll make sure you get that, that class. Um, well, I'm just real quick putting this in there just to kind of key it so people can kind of tune in if they, if they're watching it later that they got to see right. this. So, um, uh, well, you know, uh, Lee, I do want you to stick around after the broadcast yeah. ends. Um, so don't go anywhere. Okay. Um, but I, I do want to thank you, you know, on behalf of the camera shop and, and just being able to do this. I mean, no, normally we only do this for like 45 minutes to an hour. And it's it's kind of like my my uh, my podcast that I do with one of my friends uh, when we start talking about other things. We just we just when you're passionate about something, you just carry on and on. And it's and it's you and and it's one of those things that I can't thank you enough for the time that you've given us because you've given us two hours, not just one hour. And I, and I thank you for the the tips and the tricks and the, and showing us and sharing with the images and just a little bit of who you are and your background and how you've gotten where you're at. And um, you know, if, as if anyone's gotten this far, or you're watching this far, um, I would encourage you. I've seen some of the images. I, I the way that uh, Lee is talking about his work. Um, in fact, Lee, I'm, I'm actually, you know, my buddy Ashton lives out in Montrose. I'm thinking I, I might have to come out and, and visit you sometime when I'm out that way and maybe do one of your, your photo tours because I know he knows some people out there and he says, hey, I know this guy and I'll, I'll send messages to him and where he's at because I've been to Ridgeway, I've been to Telluride, I've been to U-Ray. Um, it's just, it's so beautiful out there in the fall. So I might have to, I might have to harass you soon. Yeah, after sure, that. absolutely. I'd love it. I'd love it. You bet, yes. Um, so real quick, guys, if there's if there's not any other questions, we're we're about to close this out here. Um, I guess uh, is there is there one last uh, one last tip for the for the ringer here, uh, Lee? Any one last kind of little nugget of goodie before the the class on Thursday? Yeah, sure. Pay attention to your posture. I call it the iPhone pose, standing up at eye level. Most wildlife, and I will add, I think most landscape photography at eye level is really boring. And, and I know as we get older, kneeling, lying down, sitting can be harder. But why not take the time to go ahead and change your level? Because I, I see so many people, they just extend the tripod to the max, set up the camera, yawn, 8 million images like that. And so don't forget 
your level. Adjusting your level can make all the difference in the world. Taking a knee, sitting down, laying flat, you know, shooting bats in Costa Rica, laying on my, my back. I had one lady, oh, I'll get my clothes muddy. You're going to spend all this money on camera gear and travel, and you're afraid to get a little muddy. It'll wash out. And if it doesn't, so what? You got the shot. So, you know, change your level. Take people into the world at, in ways they don't expect because it's that level that surprises us and brings the viewer into your image, which is what we really want to do. We want our image to, to move them, to emote. You know, a great song emotes. It, it moves you in one way or another. Same or poetry. Same thing with photography. If you look at an image and you're not moved, then eh, did I really capture it? So that I would say is pay attention to your level. If the first thing you do is when you get out of cars, you set your tripod to its max level, regardless of what you're shooting, uh, you're, you're disadvantaging yourself right off the bat. And that's that's a great last piece of advice. Well, there aren't any questions. We're coming up right on two hours. What time is that broadcast, our, our live workshop? Or our workshop, what time is that? Oh, great That's a good question, question right? Yes. You know what? I, I'll, I'll, I'll pull I've it up here real quick. It's crazy going on that remembering it all. There's a reason I have my – I use my calendar on my phone all the time because I never can remember. It is 6 p.m. here, so that's going to be 7 p.m. No, hold on. See? Yep, 7 p.m. Yep, I've got it right here, 7 okay. p.m. Uh, yes. That's going to be hosted by Get Olympus, making the most – of the wildlife photographic experience. So that's going to be 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. next Thursday. Um, we've got our ticket link up on our Facebook page under the events tab. And uh, our, our gracious host here, our, our educator, uh, Lee Hoy, uh, he will be uh, directing and hosting that class. I mean, uh, be directing and educating us that evening. And uh, again, uh, Lee, uh, again, stick around. Uh, okay. But I want to say... Thank you so much for giving us uh, your time this evening. Sure. And um, uh, can we do this again some other time? Is that something we could? I would be not thrilled to do it for y'all. I listen. It's like local bookstores, local camera stores. I'll admit, when Amazon first came out, I bought a lot of books off there. Now I don't. I won't because the reality is, is without those local bookstores, without the local camera stores, there's knowledge that goes out the window. So any way I can help a local business. Uh, I'm all for it. Absolutely. 100%. I'd love to do it again sometime. And I can talk lots of different types of photography. And I enjoy it because for me, when I first began, it was decades before I ever talked to a single other photographer. I learned it all on my own, which in ways benefited me. But I know that I have information. Frankly, I have a lot of failures I can share from. And that's what you learn the most from is what I did wrong versus what I did right. So, you know, when you see the, 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 the incredible shot of the wasp in flight, listen, the number of times that's triggered that I didn't get anything or a bad picture, whatever, is way more than the great ones. But it's that great one. That, oh, now I'm going to try again now. Yeah, it makes it makes up for all the makes up for all the failures when you get that one. And I and I can speak of that because when I shoot the night sky and you can shoot the night sky and you're just like, yep, I'm getting some good stuff. I'm getting some good stuff. But when you finally like, yep, that's the one. That's and the one. then it, it, it just, you're filled up for the whole night. You're like, yep, that's it. I'm done. I don't need anything else. No. So I, I know the feeling. So, Hey, uh, thanks again, Lee. We'll let you go. Okay. Uh, stick around, but Hey, everyone else next week, Thursday, if you need any information on that, give us a call. Don't forget Lee has that special offer for you guys. If you spend five thousand, he'll give you two hours in the class. If you spend three thousand, he'll give you a one-hour class uh, at no cost to you. Uh, that's all his expertise uh, for you, uh, just uh, as a benefit for the purchase. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, have a good night, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Thank you all. Good night.